Welcome to Biology 137. This is the very first lab exercise, and here is the checklist that tells you all the things you're going to learn in the next 28 pages. One of the things I hear from students is, when am I ever going to need this stuff? Why is this important? Why are you doing this to me? So let me just give you an example. Be able to convert from one metric unit to another. Let's say that you are a nurse and you're trying to figure out a dosage of a medicine for someone. They don't do the same measurements that people do in the kitchen. They use the metric system. And if you don't know the metric system, you may end up killing a patient. So it's kind of important that you learn this. So I'll give you some helpful hints. And another thing, if you have trouble with metric units, you can always go to YouTube and look for Khan Academy, K-H-A-N Academy, and he will show you how to do the math. He's very good at this sort of thing, and so you can get more and more exercise. All right, different bases measure different things. So if you walk up to somebody in another country and you say, oh, I weigh 100 pounds, they'll just look at you and kind of blink at you because everywhere else that's not the United States uses the metric system. And so they would say, oh, I weigh this many kilograms. So it seems in the uh, United States, the only people who understand the metric system very well are uh, drug dealers and people who work in laboratories. So hopefully uh, you will go into this, uh, learning this, and not become a drug dealer. Uh, you'll become a medical professional instead. And then we're going to learn some muscle skin model things. We have a baby doll, and you're going to learn the different areas of the baby doll. Um, if we were doing this in person, then you could learn it on your lab partner, and you can point to their elbow, and you can point to their knee, and name the different parts. But uh, anyway, it's, it's um, uh, just one of the things that helps if you have a baby doll. And in fact, when I was learning this, I bought my own little baby doll and labeled it so that I could remember it. So just a little helpful hint there. All right, so here's your list of things that we're going to do, and I'm going to go on and scroll down here. Now, this is the uh, table, but when I was looking at it, I noticed that there were some errors, like this is hecto instead of ector, so um, I'm not sure why uh, that's misspelled there. So I went and I found one that I like a little bit better, and here you go. I think this one's going to help a little bit more. So right here is either grams or liters, something of the metric system. And here you have just one liter, one gram. But with the advent of computers, you guys are going to find you already know a lot of these prefixes. Uh, and so it may make it a little bit easier for you to learn these. So the nice thing about the metric system, once you get the hang of it, basically you're just moving a decimal point. And if you do 10 to the first, you move the decimal point one place. If you go 10 to the second, you move the decimal place two times. So it makes it really, really easy. Now why I say that people in the computer era have a heads up on metric, because the computer people do also use the metric system. And so sometimes you say, oh, I have a, so many kilobytes. This, this picture is this size, or this game is so big, it won't fit on my computer. So we talk about kilobytes, we talk about megabytes, and gigabytes. I remember when they started having gigabytes, and that was so exciting that you had so much memory on your computer. And of course, you should know after gigabyte, there's terabytes. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about liters or if you're talking about grams or if you're talking about bytes. You just add the, the appropriate prefix. So deca is 10 grams or 10 liters or 10 uh, bytes. Hecta is 100. And if you forget, 10 to the second is 100. There you go. And kilo is 1,000 mega, giga. 
So we go on up uh, that way, getting larger and larger and larger. Now, here you go smaller and smaller. So if deca is 10 times bigger, then deca is a tenth. So whatever the gram is or the liter is or the byte, you divide it by 10. And it'll end up being 0.1 or their negative 1. Centa is one hundredths. There's the TH, one hundredths. Hecta is one hundred and centa is one hundredths. And milla is one thousandth. So that's where you take a gram and you divide it into a thousand pieces. So a milligram is very, very, very tiny. A milliliter, very, very tiny. So you know what a liter is because we drink Cokes and two liter bottles. But if you were to take that and divide the Coke out into a thousand drinks, a thousand little drops, then you'd have a milliliter. It's a thousandth. So you divide it up into a thousand pieces. If you divide it up into a million pieces, now you're in the microliter or microgram range. And then going down to a billionth, you're now in the nano region. So when you're looking at toxic substances in people's bodies, sometimes you, they're reported in microliters or nanograms. So it's important that you learn these, and they're not that hard, especially, like I said, because you already know a lot of these just from computers. Make sure that you remember each of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You should learn these ten things and just memorize them. There's there's nothing, um, uh, no other way of doing it. Um, of course, if you're taking a test, you have to have it memorized. But in the real world, you can always just go into Google and just say convert uh, decagrams to kilograms, and it'll do it for you. But you need to learn how to do it without uh, a computer because when you have a quiz, that's one of the questions that they're going to ask you. They're going to have you convert something. All right, so let's go back to our... All right, and so it gives you some examples. It works a couple of them for you and tells you how to do it. So millimeters are much smaller than meters. Millimeters are smaller. So you know that whatever number here is going to be a decimal. So you look on your little table up here and you say millimeters. Okay, that's 10 to the minus 3. So what you're going to do is you're going to either divide by a thousandth or you just look at that minus 3 and you go, oh, I'm going to move my decimal place three places to the left. And so you take the 46 and you move the decimal place 1, 2, and I have to add a zero as a placeholder, and so I end up with 0.046. So 46 millimeters is 0.046 meters. And then you go to um, centigrams, that's 10 to the minus 2, and you're going to go to milligrams. So centigrams is bigger than milligrams, so I'm going to get... From minus 2 to minus 3, I'm going to get 10 times. Minus 2 to minus 3 is the difference of 10. And if you take the 400 and multiply it by 10, you get 4,000. So you're moving the decimal place to the right. Again, if this is Greek to you, if you did not learn this in school, I highly recommend you watch the Khan Academy video. It's only a few minutes long, but he will go over it and work several more problems. And here are some more. You can practice these and see if you can do them. And since this is just your lab, you're welcome to go onto the internet and check your answers and see if you converted it correctly. So make sure that you're able to do these conversions. It's important when you're talking about a human, which side is which. So for example, if you have a surgeon that's going to cut off 
your left little finger, they need to know which is your left side, not their left side. So one of the things that you're going to learn is the correct anatomical position. And in this case, although this is on my right side, if I reach out my right hand, this is what I touch. This is the man's left arm. So make sure that you practice that. And in the correct anatomical position, the hands are facing forward and the back of the hands are facing behind you. And actually, he should be rocked up on his heels just a little bit because the top of your foot should be behind you and the sole of your foot should be uh, forward. So um, the, the same thing with the, um, the penis. The side, if you're erect, this is the back side. And then the part that we can't see is the front side. So this particular man is not in the correct anatomical position. But I guess uh, that would be too naughty. And so, anyway. They want you to talk about what is this region right here and what is this region right here. Make sure that you know those two regions. To help you guys out, I've posted something in your lab folder that says labeled uh, lab one. So here's that picture we were looking at a second ago. And this tells you this area is the thoracic region right there. This whole thing is the thoracic region. And then this gives you a little more information. But you just need to know that this is the thoracic region. And this is the abdominal region right in through there. So most of us know our abdomen and our thorax. We're pretty good on that. Although I have to tell you that I went in for an ultrasound of my abdomen to look for a hernia and the girl didn't know where the abdomen was and so she did a scan between my breast in that region right there and I didn't even know what to do so I went back to the doctor and I said she didn't even know where my abdomen was and when I told her that she needed to scan this area down here she goes oh no I can't do that I don't have time for that I'll just do this part right here so anyway that was my abdominal ultrasound and then if you go to the back, this area is your dorsal region. So the front of your body is your ventral region, ventral, and the back is your dorsal. And I don't have any trouble uh, with that particular word because if you stop and think about a shark, all right, can everybody see that shark? And its fin is cutting through the water. It's on the back of its body. That's its dorsal fin, and you hear the da 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 song that you hear with the with the shark coming at you. So dorsal is the back part, and ventral is the front part. Now another set of terms that you're going to learn are anterior and posterior, and uh, you can under you remember the posterior because your your uh, uh, gluteus maximus is in the region of the back end. I remember it because when I was little, my mother would say that she was going to spank my popo. So that's what she called it. So I can remember my posterior side is the back part of me, and the anterior side is the front part of me, all of the front. So there you go, anterior and ventral and posterior and dorsal. Now, you say, well, why do you have two different words for the same thing? Well, for us, we're upright. So posterior and dorsal are the same. But if you look at it like a dog, then the posterior is the back end of the dog, you know, where its tail is. And the dorsal would be along its back where you scratch it on its back. So they have two different terms because uh, not everybody stands upright. And so the, the terms apply to all animals, not just humans. 
All right, again, looking at the cheat sheet that I gave you, some of the terms that you're going to be using throughout this semester, and if you go on and take the second half of anatomy physiology, you'll be using them second semester also. Um, you have superior and inferior. So superior is closest to your head. Inferior is below that. So you usually use it when you're comparing two different things. For example, uh, your shoulder is superior to your belly button. So superior is above and inferior is below. Your feet are inferior to your knees. And then you have lateral which is away from the middle, and medial, which is towards the, mid the middle. So we'll, we're going to name, uh, use the word lateral and medial when we're talking about muscles and uh, all kinds of things. So y you just need to learn them. And then bilateral is on both sides. So you have hands on both sides, you have feet on both sides. So yeah, you, you tend to have a lot of bilateral symmetry in your body. You have an eye on each side. Ipsilateral is where you're on the same side. And contralateral is on the opposite side. So if you were given an instruction and they say, you know, start an IV and then contralaterally go over and take a, a blood sample. Well, they're telling you to go over to the other side of the patient and don't try to draw blood in the same arm that you've got the IV going. So contralateral. Um, if you're going into um, uh, taking x-rays, if you're going to be an x-ray technician, radiologist, then you'll need to know these for sure because they'll tell you to take a, you, you need a more lateral picture, uh, you need a more medial picture to look at certain things. And uh, we've already talked about dorsal and ventral, and proximal and distal. Proximal is closer to your body, and distal is more distant. So your shoulder is proximal because it's actually touching your the trunk of your body, and distal would be like your fingers, your phalanges. They are the most distal part, or your toes are the most distal part the furthest away from you. And then palmar is, uh, these are for dogs. <laughs> also, you don't have to learn the dog parts. So anyway. So here's our muscle man. And we're going to look and see if we can figure this out. So A is what to be. Well, here's A up here. And there's B. So I would say A is superior to be. It's higher up than that is. Uh, F and G are on the same side. So what is our word for on the same side? Is it ipsilateral or contralateral? So look that up. Let's make sure you know these things. Now here are planes of references that you need to know. So when you're making a slice through. So you make a slice through, of course, if you're doing a, an autopsy, but if you are scanning somebody with a PET scan or a CAT scan, or are you taking an x-ray, then you need to know what plane to take the picture. So the um, cross-section or transverse plane is where you cut the person in half. So you can cut at the ankles, cut the feet off, you can cut at the knees, you can cut at the waist, and on up. So any of these would be a cross section or a transverse plane. So any of these cuts that you would make in that direction. If you chop somebody's head off, you did a transverse cut. And then the sagittal. Sagittal is where you are cutting uh, like between the eyes, that would be mid-sagittal. That's in the very, very middle. But you can also make cuts coming on out. So you can make a cut and cut the person's arm off, or you can cut the person's ear off. And all of those would be sagittal cuts. So the only mid-sagittal cut would be if you cut directly between the eyes, down the nose, 
and all the way down so to cut the person exactly in half. So it's mid-sagittal. And then the frontal is where you're cutting across, like from shoulder to shoulder or from ear to ear. And this is also known as a coronal cut. So make sure that you know what they're talking about when they, when they tell you this. And you think, well, where am I going to need this? I'm not going to be an x-ray technician, and I'm not going to do ultrasounds, or I'm not going to do CAT scans. Well, later on in the course, you're going to be looking at uh, cross-sections or sagittal cuts of different organs, and you're going to be looking at slides, and it's important to know which orientation that they put the knife when they were making the slices so that you know what you're looking at. Um, here's an example right here where they cut a sheep brain in half, exactly. So it's a mid-sagittal. So they cut it between the eyes when they cut the, the uh, brain. Here's another picture. This is a frontal or a coronal section of the sheep brain. So if you can remember that frontal or coronal is from ear to ear, then you know the orientation of the brain. You kind of see the sheep's ears here, and then they cut through that way. And here's a transverse or a cross section of the sheep brain. So in on the exam, they may give you this picture or this picture or this picture and say, is this a sagittal cut or is it a coronal cut or is it a transverse cut? So it's important that you understand the difference in orientation of these three things so that you can recognize which cut was made. Lab one has a lot of information for you to learn. The good thing is, over the course of the uh, uh, labs, you're going to relearn these and relearn them and relearn them. So we're going to reuse those. So, you, for example, here is the frontal region on the baby. But when we do the brain, you're going to find out that the frontal lobe is right there. And when we learn the parts of the skull, you're going to find out that the part of the skull, the bone that's right there, is known as the frontal bone. So we're going to revisit these terms over and over again. Most of you know the oral region. When they say give somebody medicine orally, you know to put it in their mouth. Nasal. So some of these you already know. Now, buccal. Unless you have been to the dentist and they've talked about a buccal or something to do with your cheek, then you don't really know what buccal means. And uh, I do remember a student that got me tickled because I said buccal is cheek. And so they remembered the um, butt cheek as a buccal region, and it's not. So buccal is the cheek on your face. Now, here's one that's kind of weird. Your eye is considered your orbital region. And if you were to peel back the skin, you would actually see a round muscle right there. And that's your orbital muscle. So orbital is a little bit like, wow, how do I remember that? So I don't know. Roll your eyes and say, how can I remember orbital? Cranial. Um... I, most people call it cranial. I've not seen them call it cephalic, but uh, a hydrocephalic is somebody who has water on the brain. So I have seen it, it used in, in that particular term. The clavicular is close to the clavicle. So when we learn the bones, you're going to learn where your clavicle is and your sternum and things like that. This one threw me for a loop. The cervical region, most ladies know where their cervix is. It's the bottom of their uterus. It's the opening into their uterus. And so when somebody was talking about the cervical region, I thought they were talking about a lady's private parts. But the upper part of your neck 
is also known as a cervical region. So if someone was hung uh, back in the olden days when they hung people, you would snap the bones in the cervical region right in through there. So that's your cervical region. The acromial is where the intersection of your shoulder and your arm, right in through there. And axillary, A-X-I-L-L-A-R-Y, sometimes they'll tell you, take the patient's temperature, uh, get, get an axillary temperature, and you would put the thermometer in under their arm to get uh, the temperature reading. Of course, nowadays, they just use the uh, infrared and they shoot the uh, bounce rays off of your forehead and it tells you whether or not you have a fever. But back in the day, you could either do a rectal or you could do an axillary or you could do an oral. To, those were the ways you took temperatures. The upper part of your arm is your brachial. Your brachial your pecs are the area, your breast area, your pectoral region, your sternal region is where your sternum is. So a lot of this stuff you guys already know. The umbilical region is your belly button. So um, happily, happily, a lot of these are uh, things you know. Now, this one is um, uh, mislabeled. The cubital region is your elbow. It's the back part. It's the dorsal part. Uh, the front part, right here, where you're going to put in IVs, where you're going to draw blood, that's the antecubital, A-N-T-E, antecubital region. So the back of the elbow is the cubital, and the front or the uh, anterior or ventral is the uh, antecubital. So, and there's the antebrachial right there. So there's the brachial and then the antebrachial or beyond. Now, the way I remember the cubital region and the antecubital region, if you studied Noah's Ark, then you know that the Ark was measured in cubits. So back in the day, they didn't have uh, tape measures and things like that. So they use the distance from the end of your hand all the way back to your elbow. And that was a cubit. So you were walking around with your own tape measure uh, attached to your body. All right. Uh, the manual region. Well, that's easy because you do it manual labor. You work with your hands. Uh, the coxal region. The inguinal region, the pubic region, I think everybody's kind of familiar with the pubic region. The femoral region is named after the femoral artery, the femur bone that runs through there. So we're going to use the, the femoral uh, terminology quite a bit. And then your kneecap is called your patella. So this is your patellar region. Your wrist is known as your carpal region, and underneath it are your carpal bones. Your digits are also known as phalanges, but this is your digital region where your phalanges are. Okay, let's go down. And your foot is your pedal. And a podiatrist is somebody who works with people's feet. So pedal, or you put your pedal to the metal. Uh, digital again, so here was the hand digital, and the toes are digits also. The curl is this lower part, so the femoral and the curl. If you're ever confused about one of the terms, look it up. You can Google things, uh, except for when you're taking a test, and of course you can't Google it then. But the peroneal region is the lateral side of your lower leg. The lateral side of your lower leg. Well, we know that medial would be in the middle, and lateral is on the outside. So the outside of your lower leg is right there. That's your peroneal. 
flipping the baby over, we still have the cranial region for the skull. And the neutral region is the back of the neck. So, hmm, I would think of a cat picking up a kitten right there in the neutral region. Maybe that'll help you. A chromial, we saw that on the front and we're seeing it again on the back. This is the intersection of your shoulder and your arm. Your brachial, your antebrachial, your axillary, your vertebral. And that kind of makes sense because that's where your vertebra are. Your lumbar region is right there. Your sacral region is right there. And then the uh, these cheeks are called the gluteal region because your gluteus maximus is right there. And, of course, when you're working out, they talk about getting your glutes tight. So there's that. And there's the coxal again, femoral. Uh, this area right here is around the genitals, the perineal region. Uh, some people pronounce it uh, uh, perennial, but and this one is hard for me to pronounce, popliteal, popliteal. That's on the back side of the kneecap. So the patellar region is your kneecap, and it's in the front. It's uh, ventral or anterior, and the back or the inside of the knee, the popliteal, is in the dorsal, the backside, or posterior region. And there's curl again. Your heel is called your calcaneal region, calcaneal. And that's going to be important uh, because you have your Achilles tendon attaching there. We talked about your um, wrist is your carpal region, and your ankle is your tarsal region. And then again, here you can see the peroneal uh, uh, or perineal, as some people call it, easier out here. So it's the lateral, it's the outside of the lower leg right there, and your digits again. Your next task is to learn the following organs on this torso model. And um, I gave you helpful hints because it's hard to tell. Are they, is this B, is it on the ribs or is it on the lungs underneath the ribs? And uh, this one, is that the where the thyroid is or is that the voice box? So um, some of them are pretty easy. E is the stomach. I mean, that's, that's easy enough to do. And this one is the liver. So everybody's pretty pretty good on that one. And your small intestines are the G. And your large intestines are the H. You have ascending, transverse, and descending. So we just need to figure out what the A and the B are. I'm going to give you access to a virtual lab. It's a copy of your lab manual but it has pop-up answers. So we were looking at this, trying to figure out what exactly in the throat that they're looking at. And here is the pop-up answers. So A is the larynx, which is your voice box. And we were looking at B, saying, well, are they talking about the ribs? Are they talking about the intercostal regions? Are they talking about the lungs? And you look down here, and it is the lungs right there. So that should help you out a little bit uh, if you go to that link and you can hide or show the various parts. For example, here is the baby and here's the baby not labeled and then you can say well show me the front labeled and so you can click on that and now it's labeled for you. And you go, okay, let me let me see if I can remember. Okay, this is the cranial region. This is the orbital region, nasal, oral, buccal. 
Uh, what was that one right there where the shoulder and the arm? Let's see. Ah, it's the acromial region. And then the neck is a cervical region. So this is kind of nice because you can show it and hide it and show it and hide it. So I like the um, virtual lab. For our next thing we're memorizing, this should be fairly easy. You guys know your lungs right there. And they sit on your diaphragm. It's right there. And there's your heart. And it points to the left. The little point points to the left. And there is your pancreas. So we've been having a lot of people die of pancreatic cancer lately. Unfortunately, by the time you have symptoms, it's usually too late to do anything to help you. Again, in the virtual lab, remember we were trying to do A is, and I said, oh, that's going to be superior. It's above. Well, here's the answer key. A is superior to B. And B is inferior to A. And B is what to D? It is anterior. So here are your answers, and you can make them pop up and check yourself. But if you just go here and fill in the blank, you're not doing yourself any favor. You need to see if you can figure it out and then scroll down and see if your answer is correct. All right, going back to our um, torso that we were looking at, we said that B is the lungs, C is the heart, uh, D is the liver, and that was in this picture right there. And E is the stomach. So that, again, is in this picture right here. And let's see. K is urinary bladder. So you have your, your bladder. Here's your kidneys. There's the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder. You fill up your bladder, and then you have to pee. If you look at your kidneys, I is the kidney. If, it, if somebody was chewing a piece of gum, and they took the piece of gum out of their mouth and put it on top of the kidney, that's kind of what the adrenals look like to me. So you know about adrenaline, you got an adrenaline rush, but you probably didn't know that it was this little bitty thing. It looks kind of like a, somebody parked a, a wad of chewing gum on top of the kidneys. So that's your adrenal glands right there. And then we did the large and small intestines, and they show up much better in this picture uh, than in this lower one. So I think we got all of these things labeled and looked at. Here are your body cavities that you need to know and you're going to need to know that the area around the lungs is the pleural area and if somebody has an infection in the sac that encloses the lungs then they they have pleurisy so you've probably heard that word before. The thoracic region again is the area between your breast. The pericardial region is the area that holds your heart. So you know para means around and cardial means heart. So you have a, a cardiac arrest when your heart stops. The abdominal is this whole big area that's outlined in green. So that's the abdomen. And that's where your intestines are and all of that good stuff. And then of course your pelvic region is this area. So if you're a lady, uh, you would push the baby out through the pelvic girdle. Once you've learned the different cavities, look at this picture and tell what is found inside those cavities. So the cranial cavity is pretty easy. It has the brain. And the dorsal body cavity is the whole back of you and that has your spinal cord and the dorsal in the back of you. The thoracic is the heart and the lungs and the diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. 
and your pelvic cavity has your bladder, of course, and your reproductive organs, and your rectum. So it's, the, it's where the poop comes out. Um, let's see. And we, I already gave the answer to this. The pleural cavity is where your lungs are, and the pericardial cavity is where your heart is. And here we go. Here they've divided at the waist. Here's the waist. They did a uh, transverse cut there. And everything above that is the right and left upper. And below that is the right and left lower. And remember, it's not your right and left. It's the patient's right and left. So be very aware of that. So even though that, if you reached out your finger and touched the screen, would be your right hand touching the screen, you're touching the left side of this guy. Most people divide the body up into nine quadrants instead of the four we just learned. So here, if you start from the middle, that's your umbilical region. So that's your belly button. So everybody knows your umbilical cord, and that's going to be kind of easy for you. Hypo means below, and gastric means stomach. So this is going to be way down below your stomach. And above the umbilical is the epigastric, or sitting on top of the stomach region. So epigastric, hypogastric, and umbilical are kind of the easier ones. And then these are your right and left hypochondriac regions. So everybody knows what a hypochondriac is, somebody that thinks they're sick all the time. And then you have your right iliac and your left iliac. So as we talk about bones, you, we'll talk more about that. And if you know old people who walk around and they put their hand on their lower back and they go, oh, my aching sacroiliac. I was raised listening to old people say that, and I always thought that was the funniest word. Uh, but they, they're talking about the hip bones. And so this is the right and left uh, iliac region. So you need to know those nine regions. And then you need to start learning some of the names of the various parts of your body. Now, we will go into much more detail when we talk about the skin or the integumentary system. But here are some of the ones that you need to know for the quiz that you're going to have next time we meet. So in this particular semester, you're going to get off next week because it's Martin Luther King Day on Monday. So we just don't have labs that week. And then the next week, we'll do lab two, and you'll have an online quiz over this material that we're going over today. So here's your, here's your skin, and you have your epidermis and your dermis and your hypodermis. And you have your hairs. And you have the oil glands that provide oil for your, for your uh, skin. Here's a sweat gland. So it's going to be making sweat, and it's going to squirt out through there. And you can always tell where the hypodermis is because it's fat. Fat. And the dermis is where your fingerprints are, right there. And then you have a dead layer on the outside. So if we go back over to our virtual lab manual, here's the picture right here with everything labeled for you. And again, you can hide the answer key, or you can bring it back and see it. So epidermis, the dead outer layer, dermis, the part right there with your fingerprint, hypodermis, down here where the fat 
Those are blobs of fat. Your hair. That one's pretty obvious. And the oil gland is called a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous. And then there's your sweat gland. This one, we have the femur which is the upper part of your leg, and the tibia and fibula, which are the lower bones for your below your knee. And then, of course, you have your kneecap right there, which is your patella. But what they want you to know in this particular picture is that bones, femur, tibia, and fibula, and ligaments, are this is a ligament that's a ligament there's one right there there's one and there's one now when we do the joints you're going to name all of those so you guys have heard about the uh, acl the anterior cruciate ligament so you you're going to learn the names of those various things and six and seven that's a meniscus of your knee. So you're always hearing about athletes tearing out their meniscus. But uh, that happens to be cartilage. So you need to know femur, tibia, fibula, ligaments. All these are ligaments and through there. And cartilage, which is six and seven. So that's what they want you to know on this particular picture. So here's the uh, unlabeled picture. And so you know that A are your different bones and B are your ligaments. So one of the things you need to know is the difference between a ligament and a tendon. A ligament holds a bone to a bone. So here's some ligament right in through there. And of course, this is holding the kneecap to the tibia and the femur. So it's holding bone to bone, and these are holding bone to bone right here. So all of those are ligaments, ligaments. And then this one down here is cartilage through there. Six and seven is the cartilage, which you and I would call the meniscus, but we'll learn that a little bit later on. You have to know two things in this particular picture. You'll need to know what the white stuff is, and you need to know what the red stuff is. Well, obviously, the red stuff is the muscles. And if you remember what I just said, anything that holds muscle to bone is called tendons, and they tend to be gray or white. Now, if you and I are eating meat, then you're actually eating muscle. And if you're biting into it, and all of a sudden you hit a gristle, then you've either bitten into a tendon or a ligament or some sort of cartilage. So tendons and ligaments are, are what you and I would call gristles. So this just happens to be the gristles that are holding the muscles to the bone. And we call them tendons. When we learn about the nervous system, we're going to learn about the cranial nerves and we're going to learn about the spinal nerves. We're going to learn the lobes of the brain. But in this particular uh, task that's set for you, you only have to know the three things. What is in the skull, what extends from the brain, and what is yellow on this diagram that extends from the brain and the spinal cord. And here you have it labeled. The brain the spinal cord coming away from the brain, and then the nerves branching out from that. So you just need to know brain, spinal cord, and nerves for this particular picture. One of the harder things for you to learn in this particular lab are the different endocrine systems or endocrine organs. And these are the ones that secrete hormones. So most of these, this one's going to be pretty easy. Here's a lady with ovaries and a uterus. 
so the ovary, and here's a guy's testicles, so that one's pretty easy. He's going to make the hormone testosterone using those. Here's a blow-up of a testicle over here, and we talked about the pancreas, and this butterfly-looking thing is going to sit across the trachea, and that's your thyroid, and then behind it is your parathyroids. So let's look and see what the answer key is for these things. So here we are in the virtual lab where we can click on the answers. And the first one is the pituitary. It hangs from a, a, a tuberoinfundibular stalk, which you don't have to know that word. But this stalk comes down between the optic nerves be, behind your eyes. So it's kind of a weird... Uh, almost looks like a little gourd. And it's got a back and a front side. So we do, when we do the pituitary, or excuse me, the uh, endocrine system, we'll talk more about the, the front, the anterior, and the posterior pituitary. And number five is, sorry, the thyroid. So there it is, wrapped around. There's the trachea, uh, the pancreas sits right there, looks like that, and we talked about the ovaries, the testes, uh, the adrenals, are that's the one that looks like somebody put a little piece of chewing gum on top of the kidney, so here's the kidney, and here's where somebody parked their piece of chewing gum. So that's your adrenal gland sitting on top of the kidney. There you go. Got one on this side, got one on that side. So it's not too bad. You only have to know uh, seven of the different things on this particular picture. Right down here it says you do not have to know the pineal gland or pineal gland as some people call it, which is in the brain it controls your circadian rhythms, and it also, if you're feeling a little bit depressed as the days get really, really short, and it's dark out and gloomy all the time, that's because your pineal gland is not making enough melatonin, and so you just kind of feel sad or have seasonal affective disorder. But we'll learn more about the pineal gland uh, later on, so you don't have to know it for this for this first lab exam. The next thing that you need to know, you probably already know, here's your heart, and you have arteries, which are, are thick-walled, and veins, which are thin-walled, and arteries tend to carry oxygenated blood, and so they usually draw them as red, and veins are usually collecting uh, blood that's depleted in oxygen and sending it back to the heart so that it can get oxygen again. So the heart and coming off of the heart, the largest blood vessel in your body is your aorta. It looks like a hook coming out of your heart right there. And then red arteries and blue veins. So this one has its little key right there. So I don't think you'll have any trouble with that particular one. Now, most people don't even know they have a lymphatic system. So I remember the first time I took it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that is so interesting. So when you have fluids that build up in your body and your, your uh, ankles swell or your face is all puffy and swollen, it's because your lymphatic system is not draining the fluid and sending it back to your heart to be added back into your blood. So that's a whole nother topic. But in the lymphatic system, you know that you have tonsils. So everybody knows you have tonsils in the back of your throat. Most people are not, they don't know a whole lot about the thymus gland. The thymus, although in this time of COVID, a lot of people are learning about the thymus gland because it is involved with making T cells, which protect us from COVID. And old people, uh, their thymus is shriveled up and doesn't work anymore. So old people don't have protection from COVID. 
but younger people have a nice, healthy thymus gland, and a lot of them just have a, a common cold. So they don't have all the horrible, horrible stuff that happens to some of the older people who get COVID. Your spleen is also considered part of the lymphatic system and lymph nodes. So if you've ever felt uh, the doctor checking your neck, they go in, they start behind your ears and they come down your throat and then they come across your, um, your clavicle, they come across your chest. What they're doing is they're feeling to see if you have enlarged lymph nodes. They feel underneath your uh, arms and your axillary region to see if you have any lumps or bumps in there. Uh, they feel in your inguinal region. So if they're kind of reaching down where your leg and your uh, uh, genitals are, are in that area, that's your inguinal region, and you have lymphatic uh, lymph nodes there also. So a good doctor will feel and see if you have any swollen lymph nodes. And if you do, you either have an infection or you have cancer growing in your lymph nodes. So it's good that the doctor knows what the lymphatic system is and knows to feel for lumps. This one, you only have to know three things. The larynx, which is another name for the voice box, right there, and the trachea. So this is what leads down and it branches off and goes down into the lungs. And it is, uh, it has a hard ring and then a softer ring and then a hard ring and a softer ring. So the trachea is very unmistakable, but you and I would call it your windpipe. And sometimes you get something caught trying to pass through the larynx and into the trachea and you start choking. And you can do the Heimlich maneuver and pop it back out of the trachea through the larynx and back up into the mouth. And then, of course, here's your lungs. I hear your lungs. So you only have to know those three parts for the uh, respiratory system. All right, digestive system. You are a tube within a tube. So the outside of your body kind of looks like a tube. And then if you go inside, starting with your mouth and going down your esophagus, and getting into your stomach, and then passing past your pancreas and going into your small intestines, and then coming out past your appendix, and going into your large intestines until it reaches your rectum and your anus, and you pass it out. So here are the parts of the digestive system that you're supposed to know right here. So going into the virtual lab that has the pop-up answers, we see that what they want for number one is the teeth. So there in your mouth, you have the teeth. And number six is your esophagus, which is the one that goes down to the stomach, which is seven. And nine is your pancreas. I mean, I bet you they're going to ask you the pancreas on the quiz because they've shown it in just about every slide, it seems like. Inside your liver, if you lift your liver up and look underneath, you're going to find this weird green thing, and that's your gallbladder. So you've probably heard people who had to have their gallbladder out because they had stones in their gallbladder. It emulsifies the fats. So people who don't have a gallbladder, when they go to the bathroom, sometimes their poop floats because they can't break down the fats, and so it makes the, the poop buoyant floating around. So 11 is the liver, or excuse me, 12 is the liver, 11 is the gallbladder, sorry about that, and small intestines, large intestines, and you have the ascending, the transverse, goes across, and the descending, so this is the way the poop flows out of the small intestines. It ascends, transverses, 
and then descends and then exits the body. This next slide is showing you your excretory or your uh, urinary system. Again, here's your kidneys. And there's a little piece of chewing gum looking stuff that's parked on the top. That's your adrenals. And the tube that comes out from each of the kidneys is called a ureter. And they drain into the bladder. And then exiting from the bladder is your urethra. So you, the problem is ureter and urethra both start with U. So a lot of times kids got those two confused. Ureter, urethra. So don't you be one of those kids that gets confused. And there's your bladder, there's your kidneys, there's your adrenals. Here's the male reproductive system. Some of the things on it are pretty obvious. For example, there's the penis. That's pretty easy. And then you have the testicles. So that's pretty easy. But they've got three numbers for the testicles. So we have to figure out which one they want to be the scrotum and which one they want to be the epididymis and which one they want to be the testicle itself. And then we have this. So we know this is a bladder. And we know that this is, because we can see the anus, we know this must be the descending colon right there. So let's go look at our cheat sheet and see what the answers are. And here we go with the answers. So we were right on that one. The scrotum is the sac around the testicles. And 38 is the seminal vesicle right there is a seminal vesicle the prostate if you're a guy over the age of 40 you probably know about your prostate here's where the urine leaves the bladder comes down the urethra and then comes on out the end of the penis right here is a prostate and for some reason i think it's appropriate that they put a 40 on there after the age of 40 and almost every guy, the prostate starts swelling up and it makes it hard for the urine to leave the bladder. So they'll think that, you know, they peed and they go, you know, okay, I'm finished. And then they think, that is so weird. I just peed and I, I still need to pee. It's because the prostate's swollen right there and pinches off the urethra. So it makes it hard to pass urine. So hopefully you'll remember that. And the testes is 52. And if you look on the outside of the testes, once the sperm have been made, we're going to learn this when we do sex ed, once the sperm have been made in the testicle or the testis, then it moves into this little tube-like thing right here, and it's stored up until the guy's ready to ejaculate. And then once he's ready to ejaculate, the sperm come out of the epididymis, epididymis, and then they come out through the vas deferens, and it says the vas deferens is not shown. But you've probably heard of people who had uh, a vasectomy. They cut this exit from the epididymis so that if you ejaculate, the sperm can't come out and go through the vas deferens and then come out through the penis. They get, they get stuck right there. And your body just consumes them. It just it dissolves them and, and uses them for nutrients. So, uh, but you're still going to ejaculate uh, prostate fluid from the prostate and seminal fluid from the seminal vesicle. But we'll learn more about that when we get into sex ed. Here's a kind of a weird cut through to showing the parts of a female reproductive system. So here's the uterus, and that's where the baby forms if you get pregnant. Sorry. And here are the fallopian tubes. 
right here. So the egg has to go through the fallopian tube and drop off into the uterus if you're going to get pregnant. The vagina, I think everybody's pretty well familiar with where, where and what the vagina looks like. So the other thing, which is kind of hard to find here, is just like the epididymis was on the outside of the testes or the testicle, the um, uh, fallopian tube, also some people call it uterine tube or oviducts, are uh, on the outside and there, right there, and over here are the woman's ovaries. So guys have their testicles outside their body, and women have their ovaries up inside their body, and they drop eggs from the ovary, travels through the fallopian tube, meets up with some sperm, and then the fertilized egg ends up in the uterus, and you have a baby. And then you pass it out through your vagina, when you give birth, unless you have a C-section, a cesarean section, and they'll just slice right in through there, reach in the uterus, take the baby out, sew you right back up. And as Daffy Duck says, that, that, that's all, folks. <laughs>